This is chapter 9, Workers' Compensation Legislation. Uh, it is also uh, continuing from chapter 8, where we discussed occupational health and safety. And by the way, uh, both occupational health and safety and workers' compensation, they uh, come from the same act, same legislation, uh, which is the Workers' Compensation Act. So, as I mentioned in Chapter 8, in an unfortunate event, the uh, primary objective of the legislation was not met. Um, in other words, an accident or injury or illness uh, was prevented. Then the employee, the worker, may be entitled to workers' compensation. So this is what we'll be looking at in this chapter. And the main objectives are to identify the key features of the workers' compensation legislation and also what the role of the worker, workers' compensation boards um, is in BC mainly. Uh, we'll also be um, aiming at understanding the eligibility requirements for statutory benefits and compensation um, in event uh, an accident, injury, uh, or illness uh, takes place. We'll also understand the system's uh, funding and assessment of employers. And we'll also look at some functions of the workers' compensation boards and how the appeal uh, structure uh, is in BC. Um, it may be a short chapter, by the way, hopefully, if I don't talk too much. So the objectives of the legislation here, the workers' compensation, um, the first one is the Act functions as a no-fault insurance. So it is a type of insurance that requires no fault. I'll be explaining this uh, in the next slide. So whenever there are work-related injuries or diseases, uh, this insurance, in other words, the workers' compensation, may be available for the worker. So the Act is the Workers' Compensation Act uh, of BC, and it will be the employers that will pay the premium to fund this system, to fund this uh, insurance type, insurance-like system. Employees or workers, they do not pay uh, workers' compensation. They do not contribute only the employer. So it is only the employer paying the premiums, funding the system, but there's a trade-off. So because the employee does not uh, pay the premium and the employee may be eligible to compensation, the trade-off is that um, once the employee is compensated um, for its for their injury or illnesses, they cannot sue the employer. So um, you may remember, I very briefly mentioned this in the beginning of the course, uh, for tort law, for uh, personal injury uh, or losses in property, the a field of law that deals with those issues, with civil liability, is called tort, so the law of torts. And if it were not for the workers' compensation scheme or insurance scheme, um, a worker would be able to sue an employer if they were injured uh, related to something uh, that took place in the course of employment. But because there's workers' compensation, and this is expressed in the legislation, in the Act, 
because the worker will be compensated by the workers' compensation, then the employer is protected from being sued uh, for any torts. Okay, so let's say I'm uh, teaching in a classroom, and then uh, in an unfortunate event, a light bulb falls into my head and I get a small cut, I cannot work for a week, let's say. So I cannot sue BCAT, they are responsible for good maintenance of classrooms, etc. So in principle, I would sue them uh, to recover uh, medical costs, loss of wages, etc. But because there's workers' compensation scheme, I cannot sue them. I will be. I will file um, a workers' compensation claim and uh, be compensated by the scheme. Okay. And here, as well as the uh, occupational health and safety, the priority, the focus is on prevention and also uh, measures that will prevent uh, accidents injury and illnesses so some key features of the legislation no fault what is a no fault um, scheme so it is the system is there workers compens workers compensation is there regardless if the employer or the employee were negligent in other words regardless if uh, any of the parties uh, were careless while working uh, did not um, work at the level of uh, care that is required for that work. So let's say in my example, so BCAT has been working to maintain classrooms uh, as it is expected uh, it does, but it was an unfortunate event that a light bulb fell uh, into my head. So regardless of any negligence, of any fault, worker workers compensation is still there uh, to compensate the workers okay uh, another characteristic so benefits are funded by premiums so it is um, the employers they are paying those premiums and then a fund is created and this fund is used uh, to compensate it is illegal for workers to contribute to workers uh, compensation premiums so employers cannot in any way uh, deduct uh, any contribution from the employees for workers' compensation. Uh, workers' compensation rights cannot be waived. You have them and you cannot negotiate uh, to waive them. Uh, coverage is mandatory for most employers. We'll see in a minute. Uh, focus is on early and safe return to work, so the acronym here, RTW. So uh, make it possible uh, with the compensation, make it possible for the employee to return uh, to work as early as possible, but as long as the employee is well now. And vocational rehabilitation is also available for employees that cannot return to their original jobs due to the um, disability, could be temporary or in most, in most cases uh, permanent disabilities uh, they may have or for illnesses they may have developed. And the whole system is administered by a board called the Workers' Compensation Board. So with coverage, as I just mentioned here as one of the key features, um, Coverage is mandatory for most employers, and it is. Section 4 uh, of the Workers' Compensation Act reads uh, in a way that all employers, in their capacity as employers in BC, um, are bound by the Workers' Compensation Act, and all workers uh, in BC. So the general rule is that everyone is covered. Everyone is covered. So all employers have to pay. Uh, all uh, workers are entitled to workers' compensation. Again, that's the general rule. But as it usually is with all general rules that are ex exceptions, and 
The act itself brings two exceptions in section 42A and B for independent contractors and sole proprietors. So those, they are not uh, covered by workers' compensation. So if you are an independent contractor, you should hire insurance, civil liability insurance for yourself. And if you are a sole proprietor, um, you do business under your own name. You are not incorporated. You may have employees, etc. But workers' compensation will not be applicable to you as an employer or your employees. So again, you would be better in terms of legal risks. You would be better uh, purchasing um, civil liability insurance instead of uh, being without any uh, protection. And also the board, they may uh, exempt other employers or workers they might uh, find fit. Uh, so if we want to know uh, if there are any orders that are uh, effective, exempting either employers or employees, we would go to the Workers' Compensation Board website and search for uh, board orders. So again, Everyone, general rule, everyone is um, bound by the Workers' Compensation Act, both employers and employees. The ones who are not, they are the exception. With regards to eligibility, so the injury, the accident, the illness, the disease, they have to be arising out of and in the course of employment. So, uh, it is related to your job duties, to your working, to while you are uh, at work or performing your job duties if you are not at the work promise, uh, premises because you may be driving uh, to deliver something, to pick up something. Uh, so as long as it is related and in the course of employment, you may be eligible to workers' compensation. And as it is... Uh, written here so the injury need not result from performance of the job so long as it is reasonably incidental to job performance and a simple example here is going to the washroom so when you are working you uh, may go to the washroom several times uh, during the day and while you're going to the washroom you are not actually performing your job duties but still it is incidental to your being at the work premises and working so you would be covered if um, in an event the worker let's say fell and got injured uh, going to the washroom uh, an exception here willful misconduct so when there's intentional misconduct uh, in the side of the worker then uh, the worker may not be eligible to workers compensation so if the injury is, is serious in a way, uh, serious and uh, willful uh, misconduct, then uh, workers' compensation may not uh, cover. And examples are uh, during a criminal act. So let's say the employee was uh, jumping the fence out of uh, during a uh, uh, hours that are not uh, business hours uh, to steal something from work etc and then falls down is injured so criminal act if the employee or the worker is intoxicated could be uh, drugs could be alcohol uh, as long as there are clear policies in the company that do not allow workers to work while intoxicated um, if it was a result of an intentional self-inflicted injury uh, another example fighting when the issue is purely personal so uh, we Brazilians we uh, discuss about soccer a lot so if another employee um, a peer of mine um, is from a country in which uh, Brazil and this country they are rivals so if we were discussing about this and then we uh, engaged in a physical fight, uh, that workers' compensation would not cover. Uh, horseplay, when 
it is a deviation from the employment duties and also any other activities that are exclusively personal and they have no relationship to the employment duties. So those are clear examples in which workers' compensation benefit will not be available to the worker. Uh, continuing, so with regards to disability claims, so the employee becomes disabled, it could be on a temporary basis or even on a permanent basis. So when there's a uh, gradual uh, worsening of the situation, the burden of proof will be on the worker. So the worker is the one that has uh, to prove that performing th those job duties uh, worsened their uh, situation or contributed to that injury or to that uh, illness or disease. And uh, the same thing would apply for a pre-existing uh, conditions. Uh, but here, the, the important fact is that the worker with a pre-existing condition, so before the worker joined that company, the worker uh, already had a pre-existing condition, uh, let's say some uh, issues with their bones uh, or a fracture that was not well uh, healed. So if that um, injury uh, worsens uh, during the job, then the employee, the worker, will be entirely covered. So the entire disability uh, will be covered. However, uh, the employer itself will not uh, be responsible for the precondition cost. Okay, so the precondition cost uh, will be borne by the board's accident fund, as they call. So the employer would only uh, bear the uh, worsening of that situation. <clears throat> With regards to occupational diseases, so there has to be a uh, causal uh, relationship. Uh, in other words, a clear connection between the work and the work conditions uh, and the disease. And in the act, if you look at schedules B and uh, schedules schedules B and D, uh, there are some diseases listed there. And if a worker acquires uh, such a disease, there's a presumption that there was a uh, casual or uh, causal uh, relationship. So when I say there's a, presum a presumption, it means um, the law regards that specific disease as being uh, having been acquired in the course of employment. But this is only a presumption it is not a certainty so a presumption here means that the employer may prove that that disease was for that specific worker was not actually uh, acquired in uh, their uh, premises or because of the job duties uh, so the fact that there is a presumption uh, it means that the employer may bring proof, evidence in contrary. Um, and how do you bring proof? How do you prove like the disability claim or those occupational diseases? Always with expert uh, evidence, expert witness. So you get a, a doctor's report, nurse report, uh, psychologist, uh, counselor uh, report. So you need a specialist report. Uh, to make evidence. Evidence for the uh, relationship uh, between your injury, your disease, and your job duties, or the absence of this relationship. Okay? Uh, it could also, the disability could also be related to mental stress or any disorder or chronic pain. And they will be uh, work-related, uh, for them to be considered uh, work-related, um, the events, they must be excessive or unusual, and there has to be an objective confirmation of the events. 
So events that caused the mental stress or the disorder or the chronic pain. Okay, so the events related to the job duties. And there can't be a subjective confirmation. Oh, I believe. Oh, for me it is. No, it has to be objective. So it's like black and white. Objective confirmation of the events that caused uh, the, the mental stress or disorder or chronic pain. Okay, and again, a qualified medical expert is uh, required. A diagnosis here, or a nurse, or uh, who, who, whatever prof uh, professional is related to that situation. And <clears throat> the exception is that you cannot file a workers' compensation claim for mental stress uh, if that mental stress was. Um, created because of a compensation claim for another injury so you made a compensation claim for another um, disease or regular uh, injury and then that was denied you are appealing this and you get stressed you get uh, you develop a mental stress or any other uh, mental disorder so this um, the event that caused your mental stress or disorder is not eligible for the benefit because they are related uh, to your original or first um, workers' compensation claim, benefit claim. Okay, so that is the exception there. Uh, reiterating that the onus, the burden of proof is on the worker uh, to show this causal. A relationship with the work but there are some exceptions uh, and they are the PTSD for first responders so post-traumatic uh, stress disorders uh, certain cancers and hair attacks for firefighters uh, the schedule B I mentioned before they uh, list some indust industrial diseases that arise from specific uh, industrial processes uh, the example I bring to you is uh, primary lung, lung cancer, where there's a prolonged exposure to the dust of uranium. Or if a worker contracts a listed disease, uh, there is a presumption that the disease results from employment. And here I added rebutable presumption, but the rationale is the same as I explained here, uh, this presumption. So the presumption is rebutable. Why? Because the employer may make evidence uh, in contrary of the disease uh, being resulted from employment. Uh, in other words, there's a presumption. The employee, the worker, does not need to make evidence here, but the employer they make make they may make evidence in contrary in case uh, the disease even though it is one of the listed ones uh, they are not they were not a result of uh, the job duties of that specific worker uh, what do the benefits cover so they will cover lost earnings on the day of the injury sorry lost earnings in general but the lost the lost earnings on the day of the injury, they will be paid by the employer. So that very day, the, the worker suffered an accident or the disease made the, the worker impossible to work. Is it still covered by the employer? And then from the next day on, uh, as long as the benefit, uh, the application for the benefit was successful, uh, the worker's compensation uh, will cover. The, then the lost earnings, healthcare costs. Uh, there will be temporary uh, partial disability, can be a permanent total disability, and, and could be a temporary total disability. So they are different and they have different definitions because uh, payment uh, differ here. For temporary partial disability, the worker will get 90% of their pre-injury net earnings. 
Whereas when there's a temporary total disability, then there will be periodic payments in the same amount as if the employee had left permanently disabled, which is, again, 90% of the employee's uh, average uh, earnings. Uh, in case the uh, employee recovers from total disability because they were temporary, then the payments uh, will cease. And the permanent, permanent total disability. So here is a disability, uh, total disability. The employee cannot work anymore and it is permanent. So a very unfortunate uh, situation here. So in this case, uh, also 90% of uh, the employee's average uh, net earnings and they will be pay, uh, payable for life, okay? But remember, they are related to uh, injuries, diseases uh, that are work-related. Uh, for permanent partial disability or disfigurement, uh, so here is permanent, permanent but not permanent total. This is now permanent partial disability or disfigurement. So the employee will get also 90% of their estimated loss uh, of average earnings uh, that result from that impairment. And because it is permanent, even though it is partial, but it's permanent, then it will also be payable for life. Uh, in case the employee needs training for different job duties, then uh, the workers' compensation will cover vocational rehabilitation. Uh, and so retraining will be paid uh, by the the workers' compensation board, um, the employer is relieved from this uh, burden. Uh, death and survivor survivor uh, benefits. So a spouse uh, who survives a worker who died uh, may be entitled to a lump sum payment. So effective January this year, 2021, this lump uh, sum payment amounts to uh, a little bit less than three thousand dollars and there's also more money uh, on the top of this lump sum uh, payment related uh, on factors such as the net average earnings of the deceased the number of dependent children uh, the dependent's entitlement to Canada Pension Plan, and whether the spouse is incapacitated or not. Okay? Right, so let's look at an example uh, here. So I'm calling it case study. So Robert uh, works at, a, at an auto mechanic uh, called Autos uh, Body Shop. He has worked there for four years, net uh, earnings 1,000 per week. So while starting his eight hour shift, uh, Robert, the worker, tore a ligament in the thumb of his right hand. The same ligament he uh, damaged several years earlier worker, uh, working for a previous employee. So Otto asks a co worker to drive uh, Robert to the hospital. Robert has badly injured his hand and will not be able to use it for four weeks. In other words, we have here a temporary, because of four weeks, but total and partial disability. Okay, Because Robert uses his hands uh, to work. And Robert will require extensive uh, physiotherapy to regain full use of his uh, hand. So on the day of the injury, the employer, Otto, must pay Robert's uh, full wages and benefits. And then physiotherapy and treatments will be covered by uh, WCB, Workers' Compensation Board, and fully covered, 100%. And with regards to monetary benefits for Robert, so uh, Robert's wages, WCB will compensate 
Robert's Laws of Earnings from the first day after the date of injury based on 90% of uh, Robert's pre-injury net earnings. So Robert made 1,000 before the injury. 1,000 times 90% is $900 per week covered by workers' compensation benefit. And then uh, after four weeks uh, off, so getting the uh, temporary total uh, disability benefit, Robert will return on modified duties, meaning Robert still has a temporary uh, partial disability. And because of this, Robert uh, will earn only 500 uh, per week. So Robert here would have a loss of earnings uh, of 500 because pre-injury Robert made 1,000 and then minus 500 Robert is making now on modified duties. It is uh, equals to 500. So based, based on the benefit that is available, which is also 90%, so 90% times 500 is 450 per week. So in total, uh, on mod while in uh, modified duties, uh, Robert would earn the 500 uh, salary from the employer plus the 450, the WCB benefits, uh, totaling $450 per week while on modified duties after robert is rec is fully recovered and in case robert actually fully recovers then robert may uh, be paid 1000 again and then the wcb benefit uh, would cease so that's a real case a simple one but a real case just to uh, detail how benefit is calculated how it is paid. So uh, on the workers' compensation legislation, there's a duty to cooperate, and this duty to cooperate um, belongs to both the employee and the employer. Uh, in other words, both the employer and employee must keep in touch during the uh, temporary or uh, permanent partial or partial uh, disability and the employee the employee the worker uh, may need to disclose medical information uh, that is strictly related to uh, job duties work performance and the employer uh, has to cooperate also in terms of uh, being available and willing to make modifications uh, to the job duties for the worker to return uh, to work as early as possible. And if the employee fails to provide information, uh, medical information mostly, uh, this may result in suspension of the benefits. So the employer may inform WCB that the employee or the worker uh, failed to disclose relevant information. Uh, with regards to funding the system, the workers' compensation system, so again, uh, rent rating and reinforcing, uh, employers are the only one to pay the full cost of the system. They pay uh, by means of uh, premiums, by paying premiums, such as uh, an insurance for car, ICBC insurance, so we uh, pay premiums. Uh, again, illegal from an employer to recover uh, partial or total uh, premium from workers. Employers need to be registered with WCB. They are also required to provide information uh, to WCB in a way that WCB uh, can classify their activity, uh, uh, hence their risk for accidents. So information related to type of industry and potential uh, hazards. And this information will make the premiums uh, vary 
the premiums may go higher or may go uh, lower depending on the type of industry potential hazards. Uh, let's just take a simple example here, construction. Uh, depending on the type of construction, the uh, incidence of accidents, injuries, uh, they may be unfortunately high, so premiums for construction companies may also be high. Uh, companies, however, they uh, can try to have their premiums reduced by up to 20% if they come up with a with a certificate that is called Certificate of Recognition, uh, COR. Um, and this Certificate of uh, Recognition is administered by the BC's Partnership in Injury and Disability Prevention Program, called the Partners Program. How do you get a Certificate of Recognition? So the main way is when the employer um, has an effective uh, claims management system. So if the employers, uh, if the employer can establish they have uh, an effective claims management system, uh, they may be uh, able to get the COR, the COR, yes, COR, so Certificate of Recognition. And what is this effective claims management system? It is a system that establishes the effective procedures for investigating injuries, uh, that a system that allows to complete and file all accident reports in a way to initiate a claim process, uh, a system that documents all claims, even uh, except the, the very minor, minor ones, like a small cut in the finger, which a band-aid uh, helped, uh, a system that ensures justifiable claims are compensated promptly. Uh, employers or employees, but mostly employers, they only challenge the only uh, truly doubtful claims. Uh, they also keep notes of all contacts with WCB. They establish a uh, R. Uh, TW or return to work plan and accommodation if needed. They do not contact the employee's physician directly unless the employee uh, gives them written and express consent. So this is a privacy uh, issue here, very important. And the system also ensures confidentiality of uh, med medical files. So those medical files do not need to be uh, kept along with other uh, personal uh, files. So that are financial information on the employees, uh, why mix them with uh, medical files of employees, okay? So by having an effective claims management system, uh, employers may be able to get a certificate of recognition, uh, which uh, may reduce their premiums by up to 20%. The last uh, topic here is related to appeals. So the worker, the injured worker, or a dependent, or uh, a spouse or dependents of the deceased uh, worker, or even the employer, uh, they may appeal a decision in case they disagree. Uh, the time limit in BC is 90 days. So once the Workers' Compensation Board makes a decision to either pay the benefit or not pay the benefit, uh, whatever party who disagrees, they may uh, request a review. And this review will go to the WCA Tribunal, so the Workers' um, Compensation Administrative Tribunal. And the tribunal is independent from the board. They will either confirm, uphold the decision of the board, or they will uh, modify the decision. And after the tribunal's decision, there is still judicial review possible. So it is available, but that is not very common. It's actually very rare. Because I told you before, uh, during the course, uh, courts, they differ 
to tribunal's decision, administrative tribunal's decision, uh, quite highly. The requirements for a court to review and change the merits of an administrative tribunal, uh, they are quite uh, and very strict. Uh, there's specific case law, by the way, there's a new one um, that just came out last year, 2020, from the Supreme Court of Canada. And so the judges, the courts, they need, uh, they will only be able to review administrative tribunal decisions in case the requirements of case law uh, are, requ are met. Okay. All right, so that's uh, what I wanted to share with you about workers' compensation legislation. So we discussed about occupational health and safety in Chapter 8, and now uh, workers' compensation in Chapter 9. Thank you.